Well, good evening, everyone. And it's a perfect day to be talking about our subject tonight because it's Abraham Lincoln's, February 12th, Abraham Lincoln's 212th birthday. And if you're like me, you think, and many Americans in that sense are, many of them think that uh, Lincoln was the greatest president. And I couldn't agree more. It's his birthday. It's also, if you care, Charles Darwin's birthday, who happened to be born on the very same day in the same year as Lincoln. So happy Lincoln and Darwin's 212th birthday. We're going to talk about tonight, America's most original music. Yes, we've had great concert composers. You think of Charles Ives and Aaron Copeland and Randall Thompson and Jennifer Higdon, whom we performed not long ago. Uh, you think of our Broadway tradition, where we took what did exist before as operas and operettas and music halls from England and made a new form, which is now popular all around the world. That came from America. We think of, oh, Sousa marches. Sousa marches are played in nearly every country in the world. They love them. We think of film music. We were the center of film for so long, and a lot of film music was made here in America. But the music that was most original, that was born in America and has changed the musical profile of the world, came from African Americans here, and we celebrate that during Black History Month. It created spirituals and then grew into ragtime and blues and jazz. And all of those have been exported everywhere. Everyone loves all those musics all over the world. And so we're celebrating that tonight. We're gonna to start with Frederick Douglass, the most photographed man of the 19th century. Yes, Lincoln was the most written about, but Douglass lived 40 years longer than Lincoln. He was born nine years later, lived, died 40 years after Lincoln. So he was photographed more. What a fascinating individual. He was a former slave and a marvelous orator. And I will read you something he wrote. He said, I did not, when a slave, fully understand the deep meaning of those rude and apparently incoherent songs. I was myself within the circle so that I could then neither hear nor see as those without might see and hear. They breathed the prayer and complaint of souls overflowing with the bitterest anguish. They depressed my spirits and filled my heart with ineffable sadness. The remark in the olden time was not unfrequently made that slaves were the most contented and happy laborers in the world and their dancing and singing were referred to in proof of this alleged fact. But it was a great mistake to suppose them happy because they sometimes made those joyful noises. The songs of the slaves represented their sorrows rather than their joys. Like tears, they were a relief to aching hearts. So spirituals came out of the hearts, the aching hearts of African-American slaves. That's where they came from, period. Now, what music did the slaves know that they could create their own? Well, they learned hymns from circuit riders, the roving preachers who came around and that the behest of the plantation owners preached to them on Sundays or any day of the week when the circuit rider could get there. Those were hymns they generally sang monophonically, in unison. They sang the songs together. But they also heard harmony from the piano or the um, organ or the reed organs of the harmoniums of the plantation owners and from music that was performed on the plantations. They also heard rhythm, rhythm they had brought across the ocean and they injected into the fast spirituals and the slow spirituals with a kind of rhythmic energy and power that would not be there without their inherited sense of rhythm. Now, why were spirituals created? What's the practical side of spirituals? They had several purposes. One was simply emotional purgation, getting their feelings out. That's what Frederick Douglass was talking about. You listen to something like, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows but Jesus. That's getting their emotions out. Been in the storm so long. Every time I hear the spirit. Now here is, I'm gonna play for you, every time I feel the spirit, being sung by the Hanwuri Choir. Hanwuri Choir is workers, mostly young workers from South Korea. It's a South Korean choir 
and they sing American spirituals really beautifully. Their pronunciation of English is very idiomatic, but it's wonderful, and they sing with great gusto. Here's a Hanwuri choir. They're singing every time I hear the spirit and they are conve conveying the spirit as they sing it. The wonderful thing about spiritual is so often the music absolutely translates the emotion, the meaning into the sound of the music. Now, that was emotional purgation, getting the feelings out. Another theme of spirituals is escape through death. Death is the only freedom. Salvation will never come in this world. It will only come in the next world when we die. Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world. Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world, going home to meet with God. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, what did I see coming for to carry me home? A band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. Getting over there, going over Jordan to the next world, that is the only joy we will ever experience if you're a slave. I'm gonna ride the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm gonna ride the chariot in the morning, Lord, getting ready for the judgment day. My Lord, my Lord. Here's a spiritual arranged by Harry Burley. I'll tell you more about Harry Burley later. And I think you'll recognize it. It became one of the richest, most expressive spirituals ever created. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep river, I want to cross over into campground. I will only be happy when I perish. Now, I, my favorite rendition of this gorgeous spiritual is by Marian Anderson. Marian Anderson, African-American woman who had engaged a concert. She was a rising recitalist in the 1930s and she had engaged a concert in a hall in Washington, D.C., and then the Daughters of American Revolution, who owned the hall, discovered she was black. And so they forbade her from singing in their hall, the Daughters of American Revolution in Washington, D.C. She appealed to President Roosevelt. He granted her permission to sing her recital at the Lincoln Memorial. And it was filmed there and broadcast there, and thousands of people came to hear her there. This is not from that occasion, but here's Marian Anderson singing Deep River.
absolutely beautiful singing, that rich contralto, which finally, to almost 20 years later, this was in 1939, in the 15 years later, in the mid 50s, she was finally contracted to sing a small role at the Metropolitan Opera. She should have been singing there long, long, long before. Okay, here's another one called Ain't of That Good News. I got a crown up in the kingdom. I'm gonna lay down this world. I'm gonna shoulder up my cross. I'm gonna take it home to my Jesus. Ain't of that good news. Here's very energetically expressing the idea of hoping to be in the next world soon. energy. Ain't that good news? I'm going to be in my promised land in heaven before long. Ain't that good news sung by the Owatonna High School Choir 2009. We got some good programs going here in Minnesota. Now, another topic rather than happiness beyond death is good comes only from God, not in any sense from this world. Now, that's not all that apart from the idea that the only happiness is after death, but it's a little bit different. I can tell the world. I can tell the world about this. I can tell the nations I'm blessed. Tell them my comforter has come and he's brought joy, joy, joy to my soul. Another one of that theme is Ain't Got Time to Die. Uh, going to shout all over God's heaven. Great day. And one of my very favorites, uh, an arrangement here of My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord. The arrangement is by Moses Hogan. Moses Hogan, and I'm sorry I never met him, though I've certainly done his arrangements, lived from 1957 to 2003. He died at the age of 45 from a brain tumor. African-American guy from New Orleans. Uh, he studied at Oberlin, then Juilliard, and in Vienna to become a pianist, to become a concert pianist. It turned out that he found what he really wanted to do when he started writing arrangements of spirituals, founded the Moses Hogan Chorale, had that as long as he lived. And the uh, piece we're going to hear from him now is called My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord, sung by the Concordia Choir from up in Moorhead, Minnesota. And just listen to the energy and the strength, the counterpoint, just the vocal virtuosity of the way Moses Hogan wrote My Soul's Been Anchored.
Hogan wrote it, on the word mountaintop, we get the highest note for the Sopranos. He knows what a mountaintop is. And we hear the anchored part, we hear the basses. There they are. Spirituals have often had these dialogues. My soul's been anchored in the Lord, live by the Concordia Choir in Moorhead, and wow, is that fun. That is great. Now, all the music we've heard so far of spirituals has been a cappella choir, except for the one with Marian Anderson. Were there any instruments on the plantations doing spirituals? Oh, yes. The major instrument was one that was invented, created by those people on the plantations. Actually, it's thought, no one knows for sure, that it was created in the West Indies in the 1600s and brought to the Southern part of America when slaves were brought to from the West Indies up to uh, the continent here in the early 1700s. That instrument was the banjo. It may have been related and based on an instrument created in West Africa for tribal music back home but it became something new here and it became so popular that as you know, a lot of white people as well as black people play banjo these days. And there was even, there have been cases where slaves on plantations uh, played banjos for the white families. The kids loved it. So they taught the kids banjo lessons. They created of course, their own banjos. The only other instrument that was significant in creating any of this music was the fiddle. There were fiddles lying around and they were certainly on the white plantations and uh, the black people heard them and picked them up and played great. And banjo and fiddle were the primary instruments used to accompany spirituals, if there were any at all, in the old days. Now, how were they influential? Today, spirituals are adored by audiences everywhere. Every American chorus and many around the world, we heard one from South Korea, sing spirituals. They sing them in churches, in schools, in community choruses, in professional choruses. Who created the arrangements so they could write them? Well, there have been some created by white people like Robert Shaw and Alice Parker, like Larry Fleming, who created Give Me Jesus, an arrangement we did a couple of years ago in our MLK and the American Dream concert. And uh, Larry uh, past now is from um, Minneapolis. But most people agree that the greatest arrangements were written by people like Harry Burley, who's we heard earlier, and Moses Hogan, whom we just heard. Now, how did spirituals get around? How did people outside the plantations, outside the South, outside African-Americans hear them? The first group to do this was called the Fisk Jubilee Singers. And here they are in their original uh, manifestation. Fisk University was established in Nashville, Tennessee in 1866. By 1870, and it was made right after the Civil War to help educate black people. It was a black university. They ran into money problems fairly soon, 1871. So the treasurer and music faculty guy on campus, George White, arranged this group, these nine people you see here, to tour to raise money. Their first tour was in 1872. He called them the Jubilee Singers because of this passage from Leviticus chapter 25. And he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee. In other words, the year of Jubilee was when having been bought means nothing anymore. He's freed. And that's what they were singing about. They went that first year, 1872, to Boston and to the White House. The second year, they were so popular, they got to go to Europe. 
and they raised enough money to build the first permanent building on the campus of Fisk University in Nashville. And they also got a floor to ceiling portrait painted of them commissioned by none other than Queen Victoria. That's the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Now the primary way that spirituals got around was to have arrangements written and sung by choirs everywhere. Now it's interesting, they didn't write these arrangements for African-American choirs. African-American choirs were not particularly interested in reading music and singing what was written on the page. They knew the tunes, they knew how to make harmony, they knew how to create an arrangement among themselves. So every group that sang from the, in the African-American tradition sang their own arrangement in their own way. These arrangements were written down so that white choirs could sing spirituals. And of course, they did everywhere in churches and colleges and communities, et cetera. Now, the first great creator of these was Harry T. Burley. Burley was born in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1866. He was gifted as a musician early on and his gift was recognized and he was given a scholarship to the National Conservatory of Music. The bearer of the scholarship was Francis McDowell, whose son, Edward McDowell, was at the time considered the greatest American composer. He went to the National Conservatory of Music in New York City, which was founded by Jeanette Thurber in 1892, who wanted to have a real conservatory in America. Her husband had made a ton of money selling groceries and she liked to spend that money on music. She hired the best composer, the best known composer she could, Antonin Dvorak. Dvorak came over from Prague to make reports differ between 15 and 25 times as much as he was making on his salary at the Prague Conservatory. Harry Burley was working as a janitor at the school. And as he worked in the school, he would sing. He would sing spirituals <gasps> and he had a wonderful voice. Dvorak heard him sing and said, please come and sing for me. So Burley did. And Dvorak said, made a whole spiel, spiel, wrote about and talked about how Americans should base their music, their uniquely American music on the kind of songs that Harry Burley was singing and the other songs that he heard from Native Americans. And Dvorak tried to do that in his New World Symphony. Well, Harry Burley sang for 56 years as the soloist at St. George's Episcopal Church on East 16th Street in New York. He also composed a lot of songs. When he turned 50 in 1916, he started to write arrangements of spirituals and he wrote arrangements of spirituals for full chorus, a cappella almost always on their own, no accompaniment, and for solo voice with piano. And those solo arrangements became so popular that if you were gonna do a vocal recital in the 1920s or 30s in New York City, you better include an arrangement by Harry Burley. And we heard a little bit of his choral arrangement of Deep River a little earlier. There were many others who followed in Burley's example. John Work and Julian Work, his son, both did William Dawson. And one of my favorites, Jester Hairston. And I bet you've heard and or, or both um, seen Her, um, Jester Hairston. Uh, we sang, I think, um, I can tell the world. Uh, I've done that with many courses. I don't know if we did it with the chorale or not. But if you saw the movie Lilies of the Field in 1963 with Sidney Poitier, you know a tune that he wrote for that film, Amen. Amen, that's by Jester Harrison. And when Sidney Poitier sings it in the movie, it's not Sidney's voice you're hearing, it's Jester Harrison's. He got on screen in a couple movies in minor roles. If you've seen the 1967 Best Picture in the Heat of the Night with Rod Steiger and again, Sidney Poitier. Uh, at one point, they go to visit a wealthy man in his mansion and his butler is played by Jester Hairston, who lived to be almost 99. He lived from 2000, 1902 to almost two, to 2000, almost 99 years old. That's Jester Hairston. And that's all I'm sorry to say, I'm gonna have time for about spirituals tonight, okay? What happened to music from spirituals? Where did it go next? Well, the first offshoot was minstrel shows. Now minstrel shows we think of as being something that happened during Jim Crow times, uh, post-Civil War, but in fact, they started in the 1930s in New England and by, excuse me, the 1830s in New England before the Civil War. 
And by 1848, they were all over the country. They were most popular actually in, on the Mississippi, on the riverboats that went up and down the Mississippi. And what did they depict? They depicted mostly white people pretending to be black people and presenting the idea that slaves were happy and stupid and ignorant. It was perhaps the most racist kind of entertainment ever thought up, the blackface and all that sort of thing. And interestingly enough, after the Civil War, when the Constitution was revised and African-Americans became full citizens, full voters, able to hold office and everything else, they grew even more in popularity. Fortunately, it's died out. It is a very shameful chapter in American history, I'm sorry to say. The next thing to pop up, and we won't spend any more time on that, the next thing to pop up was called ragtime. And ragtime is fascinating. Nobody knows exactly how it got started, but its popularity was merely from 1895 to 1918, 23 years, when blues and especially jazz eclipsed ragtime and it disappeared and has kept coming back in revivals. <clears throat> One of the famous revivals for the 1973 movie, The Sting, which was set in 1938, and they had all this ragtime music in the background, and nobody was doing ragtime music in 1938. I was probably the only person at the movie saying, wait a minute, this doesn't compute. This is not, the, you should be playing big band music for this. As much as I loved ragtime, it was the wrong time for it, but fortunately, we still hear it quite a bit. How did it get started? The best theory that people have come up with is that before, Long before ragtime really happened, the African-American slaves took tunes they heard played and sung around where they lived and ragged them, took their banjo, took their fiddle, took their voices and made great syncopated rhythms out of them to have fun with them, to entertain themselves just for fun and to entertain uh, their white owners as well. But yet ragtime didn't come out as a sung or a banjo genre, it came out as a piano genre. We're just not sure exactly how it converted to that. But we know when it became popular, it became popular in the mid 1890s. Now, one of the big fads in the early 1890s was the two-step. The two-step was pretty much a march, maybe just a hair slower. And the first most popular two-step from 1891 was called the Washington Post. And if you know that as a John Philip Sousa march, you're exactly right. Sousa entertained his audiences. By that time, he had left the Marine band and he was in a band touring on his own. And he played for dances as well as for concerts and for parades, etc. And the Washington Post March became a great two-step and that rhythm became the basis of ragtime with a boom, chink, boom, chink in the left hand, steady rhythm, and the right hand ragging around it, playing syncopation where the uh, notes didn't quite line up with the left hand, and that made it fun. What was the first successful ragtime tune? It was published in 1895. And in those days, you didn't measure the value or the impact of a song by how many records you sold. There weren't records yet. You measured it by how many copies of sheet music you sold. Because most homes, at least quite a few, had a piano in the parlor, and kids or moms or dads who played the piano and to make music in the home, they had to make it themselves and they bought the sheet music and played it. And the one that was very popular, the first popular ragtime song was La Pa Ma La, which is just kind of nonsense syllables. La, L-A, Pa, P-A-S, Ma, M-A, and La, L-A again, La Pa Ma La, by a man named Ernest Hogan, born in 1865, he was 30 at the time when it became popular. His other big hit later in his life was called All Coons Look Alike to Me. He wrote the music for it. He didn't write the words, someone else wrote the words, but he let his music be used for that. He later apologized for having been part and having made money from a very racist idea. But nonetheless, that was his other big hit. But what I'd like to do for you now is play Ernest Hogan playing his own La Pa Ma La um, rag on the piano from 1895. La Pa Ma La, La Pa Ma La.
That's La Pamela by Ernest Hogan, played by himself. Now you say, my goodness, that sounds like much too good a recording to have been created that long ago. I don't know when he made it. He didn't make it as a sound recording, as a record. He made it as a piano roll recording. And you know how, I think you know how those work. Uh, you play the piano, and when you play the right kind of piano that has that hookup to it, then it put, punches holes in a roll of paper as the paper rolls around. And you take that paper and put it in the another pop, properly equipped piano, and as it plays, all the keys go down by themselves. You don't have a player playing them. They were a player piano played by itself by the roll. And that roll was used more recently on a contemporary piano, piano of our day, to create that recording. Now, the peak of ragtime came with Scott Joplin. He was born <clears throat> a couple of years after uh, Logan was. In 1867 or eight, we're not sure. He was born in Texas. He grew up in Texarkana, Texas. And his first trip out of there was in 1893, when as a young man, he went to the Chicago World's Fair not to see the fair and not to perform in the fairgrounds or he wouldn't be allowed, but in one of the bars near the fairgrounds entrance. He was playing mostly cornet in that band, but they were introducing ragtime and it became very popular. He left Chicago, went down to Sedalia, Missouri, where he lived for a long time, writing, creating, performing ragtime music on the piano. He started publishing in 1895, the same year that Hogan was publishing uh, La Pamela, um, and he got only 1% of the cost of the sheet music for each sheet. He still did pretty darn well because his music was so popular. His first huge success was the Maple Leaf Rag, created in 1897, not published until 99. But it was the biggest ragtime hit ever and it's often been said that it sold more than a million copies, the first um, popular music to do that. It wasn't true. I think after the ball earlier in the 1890s had already sold a million, but he certainly was up there with the very top and he managed to uh, get earn a pretty decent living from that. He spent the last 10 years of his life uh, in New York City. He died at the age of 50 in 1917 of tertiary syphilis, but uh, he had had quite a success as a music musician before that. And what I like to do now is listen to Scott Joplin play um, his own version of Maple Leaf Rag. Again. Sorry, Ernie, we already heard that. You've had your chance. Okay. This is Scott Joplin, again, playing it from a piano roll um, reproduce and notice there's not a lot of dynamic difference because you couldn't do that on a piano roll or subtly in the expression. You just got the notes. Here's Scott Joplin, piano roll version of Maple Leaf Rag. some notes here and there. It's his piece, he can do anything he wants. And you can look that up on YouTube or any place else. There's lots of uh, Scott Joplin versions. Here's another piece. With almost no, Scott, not yet. Um, there's another version. Uh, here's another song by Scott Joplin that you may have heard in The Sting. Uh, and this one is actually recorded on a sound recording with him playing a few years later. This is not a piano roll, but the actual recording. Here's the entertainer. Again, that uh, you can find too. Um, and by the way, if you have questions, we'll entertain some questions at the end. Uh, go into the chat uh, at the bottom of your screen and put in a question. Uh, see, there's one restriction on the questions. So answer anything you want. It has to be though a question I know the answer to. 
Don't ask anything I don't know the answer to, please. Okay. Uh, here's one more uh, ragtime guy that I absolutely loved. His name was James Herbert Ubi Blake. There's Ubi. Um, and he lived to a ripe old age, unlike Scott Joplin. He lived from 1887 to 1993. He was 86. Now, he took it on to the next step. Both his left hand and his right hand did more complicated things. He was born in Baltimore uh, to... Um, he was born, his parents were, uh, had been slaves. He was the only child of eight to survive. All his other, his brothers and sisters, siblings died in child, in uh, infancy. Uh, when he was four or five, he started playing, played first on a church organ. He tells the story of how he conceived of his Charleston rag, probably his most famous when he was 12 years old, but hang on, we'll hear him tell that story in a minute. Uh, in the 19 teens, when he was in 20s, he started partnering with a singer named Noble Sissel. And they did songs together. UB Blake would write the music, Noble Sissel would write the words. And they were so popular that in 1921, there was a whole review, a musical done of their songs on Broadway. And it was the first Broadway show featuring black performers. And in those days, if it, you had 100, 150, or if you were lucky, 200 shows, performances of a show, that was big. These days we get thousands, but in those days that was huge. They had 504 performances on Broadway, very big for that day. And he continued to make music for some time. He served in the US, uh, o, USO, entertaining soldiers in World War II. And as a result of the GI Bill afterward, he went to college in 1946. Now he was 59 years old when he went to college, but he didn't care. He graduated in two and a half years and the GI Bill paid for it. Uh, in the 1950s, he joined, he joined the revival of ragtime and he appeared in concerts, colleges and everywhere. And they put a Broadway show on showcasing his music um, with songs he wrote with Noble Sissel in 1978. And that went over 400 performances. His biggest hits, a song that you may have heard if you were listening to Harry Truman's campaign in 1948, I'm Just Wild About Harry. He actually wrote it in 1921 as part of Shuffle Along with Noble Sissel, but it was a real popular song when Harry Truman brought it, brought it back. His other big hit was Memories of You, written in 1930 for a Broadway show. And I love the fact that when Johnny Carson had his last show as host of Tonight, he had a whole retrospective of scenes of his career. Music in the background, UB Blake's Memories of You. Here is uh, UB playing his famous Charleston rag. And he'll tell us about it. I wrote this, ladies and gentlemen, in 1899. Say, I composed it. I always say I wrote it. I could not write music then. I didn't start to write music until I was 15 years old. And I'll play the Charleston rag. Now the bass you hear, these people call it boogie. We called it the walking bass. Now I'll play the Charleston rag. <laughs>
accents, some deliberately sour notes. Yubi Blake, and he was an old guy when he recorded that. Um, I was lucky enough to run into him when I was in college, a college band director. Um, the craze for ragtime was back up. Uh, 1969, 1970, uh, and Mr. Wilson, who directed the band, uh, got hold of Yubi Blake and got him to come and play a concert with us. He played that, Charleston Rag. He played uh, I'm Just Wild About Harry, uh, and he played Stars and Stripes Forever by Sousa with the band. We slowed it down a little bit to a ragtime tempo, and we'd play a little bit, then he'd play a little bit. We had it all worked out. It was a fantastic arrangement. The moment I remember came during a break in rehearsal, um, and we were in an old auditorium and been built around the turn of the century and and had very narrow aisles backstage. And I was standing in one of those aisles and he was coming down. I saw him coming, so I picked up my trombone and I started to play Memories of You, uh, the song he had written in 1930. And he stopped and looked at me. He said, you know Memories of You? I said, sure. He said, play me some more, play me some more. And in that voice that you just heard him do, he was 82, 83 at the time. So I played the song all the way he th through. He said, thanks for playing my song. I said, thanks for coming here, be with us. And we shook hands. And that was my moment with UB Blake. Wonderful guy, wonderful musician, something I'll never forget. Well, that's ragtime. And we spent a lot of time on it, even though it only lasted 23 years, but it was supplanted by jazz and by blues. And how did that happen? Where did jazz come from? Where did blues come from? Well, here's the best story that we can come up with. Music was a big part of all aspects of African-American life in the South. And in New Orleans, they made a special deal of it at a funeral. They call them jazz funerals. And what would happen is that when the church service was over and they were going to process to the cemetery, the friends, the family, the loved ones of the deceased would march to the cemetery and there would be hymns played and spirituals, lullabies, songs of mourning, sad songs would be played in the mood of a funeral to the cemetery. Once the casket had been lowered to the ground, uh, what they called, the, they had cut the body loose once that had happened and the spirit had gone to heaven, they came back, marching back into town, not playing that slow music, but playing fast music, marches and cakewalks and struts and jigs and tunes that were just exciting, symbolizing that though the dearly loved one has departed, life goes on and it's time to have life again. The slow music on the way to the funeral developed into blues. The fast music on the way back developed into jazz. And again, it was a fusion like spirituals of European and African elements. European music in the instruments that were used and in the harmony that was used. African music in the rhythm and the bending of the notes. The melody came from both parts, primarily from European. And the idea of improvisation came more from African than from European, but it was in both places, but the improv improvisation was more African. Where did this happen? First of all, and primarily in New Orleans. 
New Orleans was really a crossroad. It was a port city. So you had people coming from the Caribbean and people coming from all over the South, people coming from Itasca, Minnesota, after all, where the Mississippi began all the way down through uh, the center part of um, the country. Do we know exactly when and how it started? We don't know. Do we know where the word jazz came from? We don't know. Um, and in fact, when it was first created, it was more often called jazz, J-A-S-S. -S. Uh, but in any case, uh, jazz got started there in New Orleans. Now, uh, the first, okay. in order to perform it in these processions, you had to have instruments that were portable. And so they used the trumpet as the focus of the melody because it was the loudest. Then over the top, because it was higher, they had the clarinet doing interesting things, again, improvised. And underneath, to add some jazz and pizzazz to it, they had the trombone, clarinet, trumpet, trombone. But then they also need a bass instrument to carry the bass line. What's portable? A tuba or a sousaphone, it may be. And what can play the chords and be portable? You can't transport a piano. They had the banjo. So there it was, clarinet, trumpet, trombone, banjo, and tuba was the standard instrumentation in those days for your, what was called Dixieland quintet. In Chicago, they replaced the tuba with a string bass. They weren't processing then, they were in bars and clubs, jazz clubs. St. Louis, because remember that's Missouri was where Scott Joplin created so much of his ragtime. Piano was more popular than banjo, so piano took over and then drums came on later. We're gonna consider now the original Dixieland, it says jazz band here. Uh, this is not from their first recording. The first recording they called themselves the original Dixieland jazz band. Um, and look at the instruments they have there. They have in the front, the clarinet and the trumpet and the trombone. Now they have piano and drums. They're not using a bass instrument, a, a string bass or a tuba, but they're using the harmony on the piano. And look, wait a minute. This was supposed to be African-American music. These are white guys. What happened here? Well, the fact of the matter is when recordings got started, white bands recorded for white record sales and white audiences, black bands recorded for black record sales and black audiences, and never the twain did meet. They were kept separate. Whereas the original Dixieland jazz or jazz band, the originators of Dixieland, heavens no, African-Americans were. These were the originals, originalizers of the commercialization of jazz. And they made a pile of money playing the music that they had basically stolen from African-American musicians who couldn't uh, perform it for white people, either live or on recordings. But we're gonna listen now to this group in the first, what's considered the first jazz recording of all time. It's the original uh, Dixieland jazz band playing the livery stable blues. Livery being a place where they keep horses. You'll hear why. <laughs> Nineteen seventeen. the horse neighing? Yes. Livery stable blues. Don't do it again. Ah, they're 
they're having fun ragging around. Notice they called it a blues. It's not really a blues song. It's more a jazz song, but those words were used kind of interchangeably and something was called blues and not necessarily bluesy, uh, but it could have been like that jazzy. We're going to move now from the original Dixieland jazz band to the man who was most influential in the early days of jazz. His name was Louis Armstrong. He always claimed, Louis did, that he was born on the 4th of July in 1900. He wasn't. He was born on August 4th, 1901, basically a year later. Um, and he was nicknamed Satchmo, as you know. Now, it's interesting what Satchmo, a lot of people don't know where it came from. It was an abbreviation of the nickname he had learned early. He had gotten early when he played trumpet. He was called Satchel Mouth. He had very big lips, and it was like his mouth was as big as a satchel, and so they called him Satchel Mouth, and he shortened it to Satchmo. And even though that can seem to be a very racist term, he was always happy to be called Satch or Satchmo during his life. He was the grandson of slaves, very tough life growing up. He had very different people taking care of him because his mother was out working literally on the street. Uh, he dropped out of school at age 11, started to sing in the street with some buddies of his, and then he picked up the trumpet. He studied with one of the early Dixieland trumpeters, Buck Johnson, and then by Joe Oliver, who became known as King Oliver because he had the best uh, Dixieland band, best jazz band in New Orleans. He became the second cornet to Joe Oliver's first cornet. And then, of course, he got better than his boss, um, a man named Fletcher Henderson, who was a few years older than Louis Armstrong and ran a band in New York. He was a pianist and a very reserved, careful, tasteful man, invited him, came down, heard him play, invited him to join his band in New York and play trumpet solo with him, which he did for some time. And then his new wife, Lil Hardin, said, you know, you'll do better if you lead your own group. Go to Chicago where they're looking for somebody like you. And so Louis and Lil moved to Chicago where he performed, formed his own bands. Usually had five people in the band called the Hot Five, and then he did the Hot Seven. Now, before he made that move, we're going to hear something of that music after he made the move, recorded in Chicago. I want to hear something which I think is one of the miracles of early jazz blues performance. It was January 14th, 1925, when two immortal legends met, Bessie Smith and Louis Armstrong. And there they are, 1925. That's the album they created. Bessie Smith was 30. Louis was 23. And together with Fred Longshaw, who played piano beautifully, and on a couple tracks played harmonium, a kind of reed organ, um, they made great tunes, just the three of them. And uh, the music, the way they work together is incomparable any other time. Bessie Smith was six years older than Louis, born in 1894. She was from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and sang on the streets with her brother. She auditioned to be in dance groups and in singing groups. She worked her way up. Ma Rainey, who was the current queen of the blues, took her under her wing. Ma Rainey said, you can be as great as I am. You can follow me as the queen of the blues. And yes, she did. Started recording for Columbia Records in New York in 1923. And again, although it was Columbia Records, a white owned company, they were recording these, this music for black audiences. Generally, the lines were not crossed. She became the top singer of the day. She made 160 recordings for Columbia in her life. Um, depression cut back on her career, and unfortunately, she went through a series of unfortunate things in her personal life. She ended up dying at the age of 43 in a car wreck caused by her uh, recklessly driving boyfriend of the time. And he swipe, sideswiped a truck, and that tore her up, and she died. Actually, she had bled to death at the scene. Now, the first song we're going to hear from Louie and Bessie is called You've Been a Good Old Wagon. And I want to tell you some of the words because they're not always easy to understand. She sings, looky here, daddy. I want to tell you, please get out of my sight. I'm playing quits now right from this very night. You've had your day. Don't stand around and frown. You've been a good old wagon, daddy, but you done broke down. It ends. We won't hear the whole thing, but I want to hear the final words. There's no need to cry and make a big show. This man knows more about loving than you'll ever know. He's the king of loving. This man deserves a crown. He's a good old wagon daddy, and he ain't broke down. So she's saying goodbye to her boyfriend in a way <laughs> that only Bessie Smith can. And listen to the way 
Bessie and Louie talk to each other in this song. go to a blacksmith shop get yourself overhauled Okay, Bessie Smith and Louis Armstrong. Louis is only 23 years old when he makes that recording. What, and I've never heard a dialogue better in all of music. They're great. Well, uh, on that same uh, time, they recorded what was maybe the biggest blues tune of the time called St. Louis Blues by William Christopher Handy, W.C. Handy, uh, who was known as the father of the blues. And it's interesting, he had conceived of this song as early as 1892, maybe, and we don't know if he wrote it down at that time, but it wasn't published till 1914, more than 20 years later. Uh, so, hey, who knows what happened? Here's a little bit of, again, Louis and Bessie uh, doing St. Louis Blues. we go. Wow. We just got one more song tonight and against uh, Louis Armstrong. And it's back to Louis Armstrong and his development as a band leader, not as a solo player here. But he moved to Chicago. There's his wife, Lil, at the piano. Uh, and you see what instrumentation he's got. There's Louis playing trumpet. And he's got next to him a clarinetist and a trombonist that was standard in the jazz men's back then. And they use not only a piano, but a piano and a banjo. That was his hot five with which he made a big hit in Chicago. Now, when he had to expand it, he went to a hot seven. Okay, and I think we have, there they are, the hot seven. And usually what he did with the hot seven is he added the drums, you see the drums, and he added tuba to what he already had here the guy in the front, Louis in the back, the guy in the front is playing something that looks like a trombone slide. And I don't know how it's making music exactly. He's put down his cornet, which is in front of him. So who knows what's going on? This is not only the same hot seven that recorded what we're about to hear, but that's Louis in the hot seven. And that's his wife, Lil, on piano. Now, what is he going to create? He's going to create the Potato Head Blues. This is a song he wrote on his own. It was a jazz song, not... Um, a blues, really. They called it blues. Again, those words were kind of interchangeable back then. It was more of a hot song, okay? And it was made on May 10th, 1927. 
So more than two years after he had, uh, he's 25 now, he looks older, but he's 25. Um, and they had an incredible recording week and made huge hits. This is not a blues, it's not the standard 12 bar blues uh, shape. It's a 32 bar form in which he basically used a lot of the chords that are uh, in the song Back Home Again in Indiana, which had been recently popular. Uh, Jimmy Dodds is the clarinet player. Uh, you see him there on the right. And um, he is remarkable on this recording. And also, I'm going to play the whole thing for it. It's our last tune tonight. Um, in the last half, like the third or fourth chorus through, they uh, have what's called a stop chorus. When the band plays a chord once in a while and Louis just goes wild. And it's one of, known as one of his greatest, hottest, um, most memorable solos of all time. And this is the idea of taking New Orleans jazz, bringing it north and making it like nobody else could. So here is uh, Louis Armstrong and his hot seven playing Potato Head Blues. Hear the tuba on the bottom, it's great. the stop chorus. Stop chorus, just occasional chorus. That's the Potato Head Blues, composed by Louis Armstrong and performed by Louis Armstrong and his Hot Seven. In 1927, critic Thomas Ward, who writes online for All Music, a music review, uh, called in 2010, he called this one of, the most astonish one of the most astonishing accomplishments in all of 20th century music. And no lesser an authority than Tallulah Bankhead. I don't know if you remember her from stage and screen, but she was a great actress. And she said she took this recording and played it between acts every night when she had a show on Broadway because it revived her so she could get through the second act after working so hard in the first act. And in 1979, in his movie Manhattan, Woody Allen, who played clarinet quite a bit, um, through his life and a lot in Dixieland bands, uh, has his character in the script Alan wrote says, uh, Armstrong's recording of Potato Head Blues is one of the reasons that life is worth living. 
So here we have a tale come from pre-Civil uh, War times up until the 20th century, spirituals turning into ragtime, turning into blues, turning into jazz. And it's a fantastic story. Great for Black History Month and Lincoln's birthday. And thanks for coming along for the ride.